another edition of the Born to Run reboot with Zero Shoes and Christopher McDougall, Coach Eric Orton. And today we have a very special guest, Jimmy from Running Punks. And now I actually have not heard Jimmy's story. All I know is that Chris said we need to have him on because today we're going to start with his story and then we're going to get to all of your questions. Um, and as a reminder, um, we've got a cool giveaway. So anytime you ask questions or interact in the chat, you're entered to win um, your pair of zero shoes and your free book. And Chris is gone again as Amazing. usual. No, I'm we don't um, need him, right, Jimmy? He'll we're, be we're back. Yeah. Oh, he can hear us. Yeah, he can hear us. <laughs> Oh, now we he's really actually can just a him. phantom, I think. Oh, there, there we go. He. There we go. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over. Chris, let's hear from Jimmy, or let's hear how you know Jimmy, and let's just get into the topics. Cool. Um, so I heard about Jimmy because of our Lady Southpaw. Lady Southpaw is a punk musician in New York, and, and through a very convoluted, Eric connected Lady Southpaw with us. Us, and she wrote this book, Born to Run 2, T-O-O, -O, instead of Born to Run 2, the number. And we just became like best buddies. Uh, Jimmy, you got to meet her because she is basically a girl. You know, like you okay. too. <laughs> female and slightly better dressed. Um, so <laughs> we, met, we met Lady Southpaw and she just tapped us into the running punk. Oh, dude, you know what she was going to do? We were going to do like, 70s running tour in New York to like see all the other clubs. You basically run around yes. and like selfie out in front of all the locations. So Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, picked me to the running punks and I was just kind of keeping an eye on, on to me exactly the mindset that we have that running is about community fun force doesn't have to be fighting factors about competition so let's keep an eye on the posts and then jimmy you put up this post over the weekend and i'm like dude if this had been a year earlier that would have been a run i would have just taken the whole thread and just like transcribed right it. so tell us what was going who you are and what was going on okay yeah so um that's a nice introduction thank you very much my name is jimmy and i am uh, a running punk uh, in West Wales. I'm coming live from Wales right now. So it's midnight in 1985 or something like that. I don't know what year it is. Uh, so <laughs> I used to be a professional athlete. I was an 800 meter runner, two laps of the track. Uh, and then I quit when I was 25 years old. After finishing six at the World Championships, I quit um, athletics to start a rock band. And then I spent the next 10 years touring the world as a guitarist and singing in a rock band. So um, I had quite uh, a, a, a mixed mixed time of it. I went from being super healthy and strict to just drinking everything which I could find and um, being a nuisance on stage. And then I started running again, and that's how Running Punks was formed. I started running again, and I immediately noticed that it made me feel better uh, mentally, physically, and uh, this kind of community grew around it. So that that's where I am. That's what Running Punks is. And... The story I put up the other day was about how um, I'm a bit of a loner. Well, I'm not a bit of a loner. I am a loner. And I run, on my, I run on my own a lot. And I'm usually happy with it. I'm absolutely fine with it. But recently, I kind of got sick with my own company. I got a bit sick of it. I was, I was fed up of thinking about the same things over and over, doing the same run all the time. So I was, it bummed me out. I was feeling pretty depressed about it all. Uh, and just something told me that I need to go out running. Like, I need to go out running on the Thursday, because if I do, I'm going to meet someone. It's just like this, this feeling I had. Like if I just go to on the usual trail, I'll bump into a runner and I can run with someone. It'll be fine. So I, I, I set off from my house. And sure enough, after about 600 meters, I, I saw another runner. And I've been living here for six years. And I've probably run with people like four or five times since living here. So to see this other runner was kind of wild anyway. But I was like, right, I knew this was going to happen. This is cool. I knew this was going to happen. So... I started running with him for a little bit and he was 73 years old and like lived in this part of Wales his whole life. Uh, and we ran the usual route I run 
and he just talked the whole way and he was telling me about everything that used to be here and like how he used to run here in the 80s with his friends and they would jump on a train and then go to another part of Wales, get off the train and run. And there's no train lines here at all. The train lines are totally gone. So I ran 10 kilometers with this guy and he was just telling me like, oh, there used to be a mine down there. Uh, oh, like the field full of sheep over there. And the landscape has totally changed now. But running with him, I could kind of see it. I could imagine it. It was it was mad, like just to see this normal run I do in a, in a totally different way. So I ran 10 kilometers with him, like at a pretty good pace as well, considering he was 73 years old. And then just before we finished running together, he put like a little sprint on and he turned back and he said, right, make sure you tell everybody I'm running faster than ever and kind of just disappeared. And I was thinking, have I just imagined this whole thing? Because he seems to just get younger as the run. Yeah. As the run went on, he just got younger. Jimmy, it's like the Kate Bush song, you know? (laughs) It's me coming home now. (laughs) It was just so, like, it was so bizarre. And and I was like, I was scared to tell people about it because maybe I was thinking, he's told me all this stuff, but what if it's all not true? Like, I'll be gutted because (laughs) I love just seeing this run in a totally different way. Um, so I was like, right, that's cool. I, that's I've met someone on a run. And I feel I feel better. And then the same happened the next day. I went out for another run, and I met someone roughly the same age as me, and he's training for London Marathon. Um, and I kind of joined the path at the same time as him from two different directions. We just kind of ran into each other, and he just stopped. He said, "Hello, you okay?" I was like, "What? This is weird. Like I met two people in two days," and I, I was really honest with him. I said, "Oh, you know, not not really." Um, I'm kind of struggling to stay motivated at the moment. I'm not feeling too good. And he said, well, I'm doing my longest run before London Marathon. I could really do with someone kind of running with me. Do you want to run with me? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll run with you. So I ran with this guy for a little bit and he was just telling me about all his training and how he started running in lockdown, how he's really become like addicted to it, how he's met all his friends and how he's, he's entered loads of races around Europe and now he's training for London. So it was the same thing. Like I just ran with him, chatted to him, said goodbye. And then, but I just had this, like, I just felt really good about it. The fact that I just met these two people I never met before. And I'd, I'd hear two different stories, you know, like a, an older man who kind of runs to feel younger and someone my age who's, who's running because he wants to achieve something. So it was, it was really nice. It was really nice. You make Wales sound like the greatest running country in the world. <laughs> you know, you got both musicians, and wise running across the moors and you know vanished train sites it just sounds gorgeous yeah um and to be honest with you like i didn't see that route like that before but now i do you know i kind of just thought it was just like a path that always been there but when he said like oh in the trees there was a factory that made bricks and i was like wait where, where did the bricks come from for the factory that makes bricks is it another smaller factory that makes the bricks <laughs> do you know what I mean like just but just you and all this history of where i live now is amazing you know jimmy uh we walked away at age 25 was there something about running that drove you or is it rock that drew you in oh that's a good question um I think it was freedom that drove me away. I think I was always attracted to running because out of all the sports I did as a youngster, like rugby and football, it was the one that gave me the most freedom. And as I got better at it, like the freedom was kind of taken away. <laughs> there were little things. I remember doing a VO2 max test in the lab and you could pick your own music to like keep you motivated. And I, I picked um, Bringing It Back Home by Bob Dylan. And... I didn't do really. I didn't do particularly well in the VO2 max test. And I remember them saying, "Like, oh, maybe you should have picked a better, better album." <laughs> I was like, "You can't blame Bob Dylan for me not running." Like, it's not Bob Dylan's fault. I didn't run well today. I just didn't run well today. So it was all these little things. I was given an altitude tent to sleep in, um, and I remember saying, and I shouldn't have said it, but I did say after a month of it, they asked me, "How's the altitude tent going?" I said, "Oh, you get re- drunk really quickly in those things." Like, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I had the altitude 10 taken off me and I just I just felt oh man all these things I love are being taken away because I'm getting better at running so I loved the traveling I loved racing abroad 
some of my favorite memories of running are like the meals I had in random cities the night before races. And I was just thinking, <laughs> what what can I do which is the same as that, but not running? And I just thought, just being in a rock band, it's the same. So, so I was just called towards this idea of freedom. So, I mean, I, I guess, I think, well, you know what? We're not runners, you know, we're not all professional runners and his situation is different. But Eric and I feel that it's not Eric, half of you. So yeah, be, be warned. <laughs> so I think most of us, what happens with running is it has become such a commercialized um, performance driven activity that the thing you enjoy as a kid where you just run around like a maniac acting stupid. But as soon as you are an adult and you announce world hey and suddenly you've been qualified you know like have you run a marathon yet have you qualified for boston yeah. what kind of shoes do you wear have you been injured it's the shit and it doesn't happen yeah when you're like trying to qualify for the world championship it happens like your first week when you're just doing like the counts to 5k you're told all this stuff if yeah. you don't do this you'll get hurt if you don't do this this is your training and so i'm wondering if yeah. you don't see that same kind of, let me put it this way when you made your return. <laughs> Old habits die hard, huh, Jimmy? I know. <laughs> it's alcohol free. It's fine. There it's you fine. go. Um, when you made your return to running, were you still facing that same kind of performative? When I made my return to running, the first thing I noticed was that Strava has turned the world into a golf course. <laughs> like, it's just everything is like, you go for a run and it's almost like you've done a round of golf. Like, how did you get, like, what was your part? We we were over or under, you know, it was, it was, we, it was, cause that didn't exist. Like, you know, there was no such thing as it when I was a, an elite athlete, it was just, I had a little Casio stopwatch. I didn't know how far I'd run. Um, so that was the first thing that struck me was kind of like these people, oh, you, I'd run up a hill by my house. It just, it's just a hill by my house. And it was like, you're the 15th fastest person to ever run up this hill. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's the hill by my house. I've never seen another person running up it. Um, so I was immediately struck by that. And I kind of did feel a lot of pressure doing it, uh, just going for a run and just seeing things like someone's taken like your your segment off you. Um, there's a there's a segment near me called Druggy Dash, and someone took my Druggy Dash segment, and I was like, oh, I'm I'm really gutted about that. Um, and I just had to just check myself and think, no, 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 this is not why I'm running anymore. I'm running because it's good for me. Um, so yeah, it is 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 tricky, and like with the, the whole kit thing, there's a lot more kit now than there ever used to be. And I I always think of like shoes, buying shoes now. For some people, must be like how I feel about. I've always wanted to be a DJ. And if I want to be a DJ, I'll Google how to be a DJ. And I see all these videos of people showing you how to DJ. And it'll, it'll put me off. And I think shoes are almost like that. Or running kit is like that. You'd be like, oh, what shoes do I need? And you have all these people giving opinions on shoes. And it's it's really, like, it just never used to be like that. It's kind of, it is intimidating. You are Captain America. You're Captain America coming after 50 years in real. <laughs> what, what, what? <laughs> But do you know like, another another mad one was that I always used to I used to run in cotton t-shirts all the time. Like my long runs, a cotton t-shirt, a band t-shirt, wherever. And just the, the looks I had going out running in cotton t-shirts was <laughs> like what what's happened? Yeah, it's like um Rip Van Winkle or something. For Eric and I, the reason why we decided to do um Border Run 2 was because one came out for a while, man, there was just like this mushroom cloud over the life finally it's been revealed the entire running shoe industry is full of shit complete lies baloney garbage you know they're selling you garbage which is why you know it's the same thing like with the financial markets whenever you hear about equities and derivatives the more they fancify the language the more they put you on your back foot the more you feel yeah. like you don't understand the lingo and the vocabulary the more you're dependent on the experts who are going to explain it to you and sell you something and that's basically what happened with the running shoes. I used to call the, the bewildering wall of mayhem because you walk in, like, wait, what am I? You know, this entire <laughs> of product. <laughs> and if you make the wrong choice, you're. And then Eric yeah. and I opened my eyes and said, dude, you don't need any of this stuff. You know, the human animal has been running very, very well long before Bill Bowerman ever showed up. And it was that, that's kind of where we're at. And so that came out in 2000. 
2009, and for a long time, there were like the Bear, uh, Beaver and Five thing, or Barefoot Runners. But then it kind of flip back around again. And I know you're a Hoka's guy. We'll save that conversation for April. But see, <laughs> not even just the cushioning, but all the, you know, carbon plates and cushioning and motion yeah. control, all this junk. Yeah. I feel like learn the artistry first, learn the craft, and then you add whatever kind of junk you want to it, as opposed to like feeling you need the junk first. Yeah, totally. And like I said to you when we had a chat the other day, Born to Run, there it is, the original one that my sister bought for me on Christmas. Um, <laughs> that, amazing. I, I got that cover tattooed on my arm. Amazing. There. there it is. Yeah. Can you sign it for me? Can you sign it for me? Um, yeah, man. Right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that book, like, yeah, what you say about um, actually heel striking shortens your stride. Um, like a cushion shoe is bad for you because you keep on pushing through it, you know, trying to find contact, harder contact. That all changed my mind and like, like just changed the way I looked at running. And like I said to you, I'd always been um, orthotics and support shoes as a, as a pro elite, uh, elite athlete. And I read your book and I went out and bought neutral shoes and I kind of didn't go the, the barefoot way, but I kind of taught myself to run again in neutral shoes and I haven't had any problems. And if, if I hadn't read your book and taken that advice, I would have stopped running within a month because I was having so many problems in that first month back. That it was, it was painful and it was really, it was really depressing. Um, and I just thought, right, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what Chris says in a book. I'm going to go new, I'm going to go as neutral as I can, just get some basic shoes and and teach myself to run again. And that's what I did. And uh, funny you should say about carbon plated shoes, because I've had one injury in the past three years since running again. And it was after doing a session in carbon plated shoes, my knee just yeah. went. Well, so. Gina, I'm also glad you're here because we just had a question come. And I think you and Eric are amazingly well suited to answer. And the question is this is like what's the best way to get back into running? so i just want to preface it with one thing as an 800 meter runner eric do you think jimmy was coming in running with a special advantage the fact that he would have been a very skilled at the at the motion of running before he started recreational running yeah, I mean, he's he's coming into it from, I think, the best way to come into it, where he's got that strength of, of the really fast running, where most of the time run form is pretty darn good because of the speed they're running. Um, I would imagine his biggest challenge was learning how to run well slowly. Yes, definitely. Yeah. You know, from a from physically and mentally, like, you know, he's 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 used to, you know, what um, trying to do my math. You know, what were some of your times for the 800? Uh, one one minute, 46. OK, and so 146. <laughs> what what was your longest training run when you were competing in 800 meters? Maybe once or twice a winter, I did a hard 10 miler. Um, yeah. And I was, so I, that's pretty long for. You know, so, you know, he's not used to doing, you know, and he did that fast. So he's not used to going out just kind of trotting yeah. along. And and that's, uh, you know, as you and I've talked a lot, Chris, you know, that's where a lot of the dysfunction takes place. Yeah, me, that's kind of, and it, it was the, it was, it, was, it was the hardest thing for me to do to run slow, but it is now my favorite way to run. Yeah, right, right, right. By far, just love it. Jimmy was. Um, All right, so before we get. Jimmy's answer, how to the best way to get back into running? I say put on Lady Southpaw and run around the block and notice how you feel when you get back. Yeah. Listen to the music and and notice notice how good it feels just to go run around the block. And then the next day it's maybe two days of two times around the block. And and don't see it as fitness, see it as something joyful. Jimmy, so, um uh, Back in your in your in your competitive days, was cadence um, an issue? Like, were your coaches telling you how to monitor your foot strikes? Yeah, on on the track, definitely on the track. There was a lot of filming you in slow motion, particularly coming up the back straight. There was always a lot of emphasis on the back straight in eight hundred meters. Um, so just looking how your form was coming off a bend and going up that straight, and we were always told to like not 
have too quick a cadence in 800 meters. You, you, lots of runners have a tendency to try and move their feet really fast, and it kind of in an event like 800, that would just like it's just unnecessary. It's about just finding a nice, nice cruising pace, really. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. So the thing that baffled me at first became my like golden rule. Eric taught me was that cadence, you know, and I think 800 meters or a marathon, you want to be at that strides per minute. And I could see where, yeah, I get 800 meters lays out 300 strides a minute. You know, I'm just going to, oh my God. yeah, <laughs> I try and road runner my legs like a little blur, but you know, the, where, where this whole hundred, 80 from was uh, Jack Daniels, uh, a famous American track coach, was just videotaping all, all kind of places, and he found the elites, no matter what distance they were running, were bouncing it along at about 90 strides per leg per minute. So to me, that nice. became the magic formula because I find, oh yeah, if I do that, it runs slowly, but if it feels good and all quickly without feeling like I'm straining, but questions about this people are melting yeah. down about how they can actually run easily at 180 rides per minute what's what's your answer yeah so i'm seeing a bunch of questions right now we've got one down here i struggle to run 180 beats per minute and there's another one from kathy who says i struggle as well do i need to spend more time in gear one and two or running easy and no it's just the opposite you need to do the drills, the, the stiffening the legs and getting the legs quicker and snappier and doing sprints and doing some of the higher gear um, speeds in a short period of time that helps create that leg stiffness that then will translate over to our gear one and gear two. So all the other training running in place to 180 beats per minute, that's strength training. That's leg stiffness training. So it's it's all the all the other parts of the program that go into be having better cadence through time. It's not just a decision to go out and do it. You know, it's funny, Jimmy, when we did this Born to Run 2 book, we kind of laid it out like, okay, here's the system. But we kind of felt like, man, there's like a built-in time bomb here, which is people are just going to like flip to the back page and go, okay, what can I do now? Do they want to <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we also we also kept these exercises and drills finely tuned to the perfect ADHD customer, which is made like anything that went into the book had to go out of Eric's brain through my impatience onto the page. So right. Eric, Eric sent me like 15 exercises in chapter one. I'm like, never going to happen, dude. Never going to happen. Cannot do more than three. So we kept everything to three things, three things that I would legitimately do. That's why I posted that thing in the passport line. That wasn't even like staged. Like my daughter right, went yeah. out to the snack. I got two, two hours. What am I going to do? Uh, I'm going to do some. And I just taped it because that's literally what I was doing in the passport line. Um, and so what I, what I find people doing. Well, Jimmy, let me ask you. Let me put it in a musical question. Had you ever picked up a guitar before age 25 when you were clocking out of your track career? Yeah, I'd, I'd been playing guitar since I was about four or five, I think. Um, oh, I wrote a song. And you, just, and you immediately just started performing on stage while they actually learned how to finger some chords. The weirdest thing is that my my dad is a musician. And when, when I told him I was starting a band, <laughs> he made me practice in the dark in the house because he's like, you're going to need to get used to playing guitar in the dark because this can be dark on stage. So <laughs> that was quite funny. It was like, so the songs I'd written, he's like, can you play them in the dark? And it was like some weird kind of, it was, if it was like a Kung Fu movie, there would have been a montage of me playing guitar in, in the dark, in the, gar in the garage, in the back of a car. Yeah, <laughs> learning all this, all this stuff. But it's the same, it's the same as running. It's the same as running. Like the, the more I played guitar, I could, you know, you just play without looking at it. You can pick up any guitar and play it. So if, if you're playing a festival and the string snaps and they bring on a spare, you just, you know, you just, it's just another guitar you can play. And, I honestly think like that about trainers and stuff. Like I was at my sister's on the weekend and I, I forgot to take my running trainers. And I was like, I'll just like, what have you got here? And I borrowed, I borrowed someone she works with shoes. They were too big for me. And I just put them on and run. It's just, it was the same as just swapping a guitar for me. It was like, oh, there are. I've done, I've done all the practice. I can, I can run in anything just like you could play any guitar really. That's I didn't know punk bands could actually play guitars. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think you're fair. I think you're fair enough to say that because 
a lot of our songs we played on guitars with only four strings on. We took two strings off to make it easier, right. to, easier to play some songs. That's like morphine, right? Two yeah, strings. definitely. Yeah. yeah, totally. And he plays a slide as well, doesn't he? Is this yeah, slide? Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, we, we, we had uh, lots of... Yeah. We, should, we should open up some questions. But I'm really... This because you made that one comment too. Learning how to do so well that the instrument didn't matter. And to me, like yeah. that's like the personality for running shoes. Learn how your body operates. Learn that foot strike and that cadence on your feet. Uh, and, it, and for me, yeah, hey, way where now Eric uh, likes to and running shoes for people who are trained forward from a more structured shoe. I keep trying yeah. ultras and I feel like it's just too much shoe. There's like too, too much underfoot. It's interfering with that in the dark finger feel that you get on, on the courts, you know, on, yeah. on the shoes. And so and that's basically why we're here with zero because like, that's the thing. Zero's Luna sandals are the only things that I only feel like I'm actually ground and shoot controlling me. Yeah, that's like yeah, zero. The shoot. idea though, Chris, is to everybody to get keep whittling it down to where they're right right against the ground. So it's a process, just like you went through the process yeah. where that's that's how it works. Yeah, no, dude. This is this is an arm wrestling match you and I will have to the end of time because yeah. I I defer, <laughs> I always defer to you because frankly, you know what you're talking about, and I don't, you know, you literally know. I just go, my gut says, I, I think it's like this though, Jimmy. Like when you decide to stop drinking, you went all the way. And for me, I decided to get away from cushion. I had to go. I feel like I'm like two millimeters of foam away from backsliding entirely. Like if my foot gets full, I'm just gonna slow down. It's all gonna fall apart. So I'm probably more yeah. tourist than Eric is because his form is super locked in, you know, precarious. Well, yeah. Let's segue that into the next question because this question is the best way to run in the winter in places with snow and ice. I find <laughs> when there's snow and ice, the best time to go as minimal as possible is in the winter. And now you can train low to the ground, train for strength that will prepare you for the spring. And most times in the winter, we're not putting as many miles in as we would once spring spring comes so we can use that time to use a minimal shoe embrace the snow and ice and work on our form yeah definitely i like i like running off road uh yeah there's snow or ice i just i forget the pavement and i just go on the trails yeah you know because if you fall as well it it looks cool if you fall on the pavement you look silly (laughs) (laughs) just think about where's the best place to fall that's what i do that's right Spring your arm, do an angel, and you're good to go. Yeah, it looks like you're meant to do it. No one, no one can tell. But if you, if you fall on the pavement running past the butchers or something, then you just <laughs> you look like an idiot. Jimmy, so I think it's kind of coolly ironic, but actually very natural. Who likes to run alone is also the spearhead of a global run, global running community. You know the fact that you've founded Running Punks, and I, I love. The messages I see, everybody who, who joins in the punks online seems to come with the same spirit. So h- how do you, Yeah. what's kind of your, your feeling about that, about the community you've created? Um, I, I, I honestly, I love it. I think it's amazing. And I, but at the same time, I try not to think about it too much because um, it's, it's really rare that the whole thing came out of uh, me just trying to look after myself. I can't really think of anything, particularly on the internet, where it's just a guy trying to look after himself and his way of doing it is doing silly videos and just being a bit of a maniac. But it is helping him and that's helped other people. So I'm just kind of like, right, that's happened in a way I didn't expect. Um, so I'm going to try not to think about it or tinker with it too much. Um, but I never, I didn't even believe in the running community. I didn't even know what it was because it was Rodri who I set up Running Punks with. He, he was kind of the big into the running community and he, he was telling me I was like what what what's a running community like is it like your training partners is it not just people you know you connected online and you all share your runs I was like, that sounds I don't know about that um and then when it when it started happening I was like this is amazing this is amazing so I just feel like I'm just part of it I don't feel like it's come from me really I just I just feel part of it and I get inspired by it so it's just, yeah it's just it's just such a mad thing to be involved with 
Yeah, you know, my friend David April formed the Fishtown Beer Runners. And if anybody out there has not seen the documentary Beer Runners on YouTube or look up Beer Runners, their website online, I love it. To me, it is, with no competition, the best running film of all, of any kind, of any genre. There's no better running film, I think, than Beer Runners. And recently, after I don't know how many years, 15 or so years of leading the Fishtown Beer Runners, literally from his front stoop. You know, he lives in a row home in Northeast Philly and he would start every run from the front door of his house. On well, he, Yeah, I saw that. Isn't that amazing? Um, well, Jimmy, he, he married a woman from Spain and he just moved to Spain for the rest of his life. Ago. But what I love is he is just like a pebble disappearing into the ocean, like are the, are the Atlantic Ocean. And David became just a pebble, and the ocean, you know, lasts and endures because he. But the same attitude, same spirit, and I kind of yeah. I wonder if that's like that with the punks. You know, you've created a family, or more like a a sentiment, a worldview that really almost doesn't need. Yeah, to. yeah, and I think now and again, I feel like I just I just pop in to remind people not not to take it too seriously. So I'll I'll do a running review. I like I love doing the running reviews because. I know it's a good way to get people running for the first time. Um, when I started doing them, I had people get in touch with me and they'd be like, I've, I've wanted to run all my life. And you're the first kind of, um, to use like American terminology, like the first jock I've ever seen who's into death metal or, you know what I mean? And just just seeing a sporty person like the same music as me made me realize I could do it as well. Um, so I, I keep doing those because I know it's going to get a few people running who've never run before. And it's just a reminder that, look, it's just, just don't take this seriously. Um, what, like the, you, the good thing about running is you can work out, you can work out what's going on inside you. And that's just what, I, that's just, that's my part in the running punk suite. I just think it's to remind them, don't, don't get caught up in everything and just use your running to work out what's going on inside you. That's it. Yeah. Um, but that's why I think Eric and I felt like there's a crucial step that was missing. We burst out the door. They got 45 out. They want to, you know, blast off a bunch of calories. But what's being lost was that transitional phase where they remind themselves of techniques they had when they were five or six. You know, five and six year olds are yeah. running wired. You know, they're not doing hot yoga or, you know, uh, Pilates. Shoes. And shoes are the thing. I remember my mom always yelling at me, put your shoes on, you know, at the door. But because we sit here before we start running, natural movement is no longer natural so a couple of questions for you for one it's right i keep seeing questions from people who cannot relax into the skills you're saying like this one person saying is it okay to do 15 minutes of foot core and leg stiffeners like, yeah i mean there's no law against it but why <laughs> like ask what's too much to me that says you're not actually listening to you're listening to your brain you know your brain's telling you you better do this and your body's saying, my calves are on fire. So uh, how, do you, how do you advise people to perform this skill? Well, going back to that question, I, I don't think, um, I think doing foot core and leg stiffeners are a great warm up that anybody could do any, you know, daily. Um, but having said that, you're not going to maybe do the full workout that's prescribed in a book daily. You're, you're doing it once or twice and then getting on with your run. And so it's, it's scaling it back if you're adding more frequency. Um, but th they're a wonderful, wonderful warm up because we're warming up the brain and the brain warms up everything else. So um, th yeah, I, I think you could do that daily, but again, don't, don't do it as a workout, do it as a warm up. Take, and, and, and uh, I limit yourself to two or, two or three minutes. I think one crucial thing, you know, has a couple of athleticism is awareness. You know, athleticism yeah. is knowing what people say it all the time. Like, listen to your body. You know, your body, your DNA was formed 2 million BC. And this is, like, yeah. you guys don't speak the same language. You know, your body is a case and you are like a modern yeah. like, Uber signaler. And so you guys are not communicating well. And that's what Eric says. Athleticism is awareness. Learn that caveman language and what your body's feeling and then obey it. Don't try to override it. But the second thing is he has this, again, 
I drop this around all the time and pretend that I'm the one who came up with it. He goes, uh, expectations <laughs> are the enemy of possibilities. Did I tell you this one before, Jimmy, when we were on the phone? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I love that one. And it's perfect. People wondering about the 15 minutes of foot core. I always feel like that's expectation. Of a personal record of 15 minutes and one second, as opposed to like do the exercises and process how your body and maybe it's time to move on to another thing or maybe to continue doing it. With my foot balancing, I don't think about time or anything. I just kind of like I'm zoned in on am I getting it right? How's it feel? You know, and am I starting to yeah. perfect it? Uh, let's see. Um, where are some other questions that are coming up, Eric? I don't want to miss people. Here we go. Are, uh, how about, let's, say, I quick, let's keep a uh, quick, easy dinger. Um, oh, that's, okay. Uh, Neutral shoe positioning for more cushioned uh, shoes. Say, um, well, in the book we recommend the Ultra Escalante is a good middle of the road, um, and you know I, I still I still kind of believe that for most people that's going to feel like a really really minimal um, environment for them that's going to allow them to make that transition, um, but ultimately. <laughs> You know, you, you don't call me a purist, but I would love to see people get as close to the ground as possible or zero to the ground <laughs> as possible and, and see see all this as tools to accomplish what they want to accomplish. So, um, Jim, which, of course, me being a dumbass, I miss. Uh, I've been running barefoot for months for a three-mile run recently and felt a twinge in my calf muscle after the run, Eric. Uh, any advice to help me better mimic my barefoot form while in shoes? So the calf twinge is interesting because I've actually been uh, seeing Eric behind the scenes, Jimmy, like barefoot runner, you'll never be injured again. Meanwhile, I'm like, Eric, my calf's bugging me, man. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> but it was also, it made a lot of sense to me because I've gotten into competitive body surfing, believe it or not. And uh, when you body surf, you body fins and uh, making a lot in the fins. But to get into the water, you're running through breaking waves on soft sand in, uh, in fins. I also run bare from the beach a lot. So I was trying to ramp up my trail miles, ramp up my road miles, and uh, do about two or three hours of body surfing a day. So all that is a massive load on my calf. Now, yeah, Eric gave me the prescription. And it was kind of worth sort of. And then you said, which again, dude, magic <clears throat> pill. You said, just get out there, go up in the hills. But tell you, tell, and I'll tell you what I did. Um, I think I said, don't baby it too much and, and try to be as active as possible in a positive way. Um, yeah. Not doing too much, listening, listening to how it's feeling while you're doing it. But in not, there's not many times where doing nothing is the best thing to do. You told me yeah. to do the uh, what the piece I put together was. You told me to do our bear crawl. Yeah, from our board. and then you said, uh, and then really like isolate it, like really get into that bear yeah. crawl posture and and kind of sit on it. And then you think, oh, that's the same posture, steep hill. I got a trail near right. me with steep hill. So yesterday, my and I took what should have been. A twinge, which most people would have taken time off. And instead, I did the opposite. I went really high vertical up some steeps. Yeah. And I could feel it, feel it pull stretching. And by the time I finished, I felt so much. But the second we get off this call, I'm heading back to the same trail. So for the person who is running barefoot for months, put the shoes on. When they put the shoes on, Eric, they probably didn't. Wouldn't you guess? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, why did you put your shoes on? <laughs> <laughs> if your things right. are going so well, um, ultimately, her, her yeah, uh, his question is, uh, <clears throat> what, is there something he can do to mimic? And I would say, you know, get look what you do most of the time throughout the day. So get in a very minimal environment, walking around all day. So. Every step you take is is almost like being barefoot, and that will also help you running. Yeah, but that, uh, I think 
that thing you said about uh, you know kind of not be being uh, a, a twinge when I get quite a lot of twinges and what I see them as uh, like a heckler at the stand up comedy night. I, I see myself as a comedian and a twinge is someone heckling me and I kind of just give them what they want. I honestly, I'd be like, What do you want then? and I will ridicule them. So if I've got a bad calf, I would do what you've just said, and I've never heard that before, but I will go up a hill. I'd be like, What do you want? and I would give that that twinge is moment in the spotlight while I'm doing my stand-up comedy act. And I honestly, I feel like that works. I don't, I very rarely stop because of like a little twinge. I'd be like, okay, let's listen to it. What do you want? And then I just work it out my system. So I'm glad to hear someone else say they do that. Here's something really cool. with this in a book now for like the last three books. And for some reason I never have, but I read something online, a woman who is some kind of a trainer runner, and she said, if you ever feel a twinge on the body, and it's on the other side of your body. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, this is like crazy. I have no idea how it works. I I, I suspect the reason I, I think I know why it works, maybe. But if you're if your Achilles, if your left Achilles is bothering you, while you're imagine it's your right Achilles that bothers you, and then the left one will feel fine. Yeah. Eric, what do you like? What do you think is going on there? Yeah, I'm trying. Um, let me give me give me some thought. Give me time to think about that one. I, I got like thing. Schrodinger's twinge. Okay, yeah, that's right. Schrodinger's <laughs> twinge. Open the it box. Is. It's still alive. Yeah. So yeah, my, just... my hunch. My hunch is, if you feel twinge on one side, your body starts to compensate, and so right. you know, if your left thing is tight, you start to shorten that stride or stiffen the leg. Or, or not move it as well. But if you imagine the same twinges on the other side, then you revert back to your natural balanced movement. And so it's it's because you're actually stiffening up or shortening or babying that leg, it allows the twinge to continue. But if you remove it, then you sort of balance things out again. Well, and it goes back to the central governor theory of what's, what's really controlling things, right? Right, definitely. Right. A lot of people are asking Eric about this shoe. I'm going to show you time. It's a shoe. <laughs> no, let me show it. Let me show it. All right. Go ahead. Let's do it at the same time. Ready? Ready? Hang on, hang on a second. Ready? Hang on. I got it. I got it. Ready? One, right. One two, two, three. Three. Oh, <laughs> oh, I could have done that. I've got one of those. <laughs> yeah. I've got one of those. You got one too, huh? That's, um, that's yeah, a really awesome? nice shoe. What do you think, Jimmy? I like it, colors? yeah. Yeah, really nice, yeah. Oh, nice and flexible. Yeah, let me see the bottom again. Really light. Yo, yeah, yeah, yeah go. nice. Really nice. Good tread. It's not as good as your reviews, but I expect a review on Monday. <laughs> okay, I'll do one. I'll do one. I'll do yeah. one. one of these reviews, right? Everything. I want color. <laughs> I want laces. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, Eric and I have been working on this shoe with Zero Shoes. And, you know, it's funny because I was in a call last night with Louis Escobar, our buddy for Canyons. And, I always felt like the need, like why I'm working because I've been, I've been Mr. Anti Anti Corporation, fuck the whole business. But I, I don't know, man. I keep looking. I'm in District 12, you know, and the Hunger Games and Zero Shoes are out there in District 13, <laughs> living underground, you know, coming up to the surface. Like we've been here the whole time. We're ready to fight. <laughs> so uh, watch out, President Snow. We're coming for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah um yeah we kind of dig them we like the shoes and they have allowed us to have input on a road shoe and a trail shoe and and so Eric and I for me is extraordinarily hard i don't keep a secret work goddamn and so holding back on this but I'm, I'm pretty stoked i think we got like yeah we're like click down before we before you yeah. uh, blow a little on this thing yeah exactly almost a, exactly a month amazing yeah. Hey, Jimmy, how about you, man? What do you got going on, dude? Like, where? What's next for the punks? Um, what is next for the punks? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm just gonna keep on running into stuff, doing my doing my reviews. Um, I've got a thing planned about I'm gonna go to America next year and run with as many people I've never met before as I can. Um, kind of similar to what happened on the weekend, so last week. So yeah, that's the plan and. Make some more music. You are making music, and I would love to just—I don't know—just have another good year of running. Really, 
and 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 just figure out things. Just just keep on figuring out things. Hey, uh, can we That's can we uh, jump aboard? Can we jump aboard the band yeah. wagon? Yes, please. I would love that. I would love let it. Us, let us know when the tour starts. Yeah, it's, it's looking like it's going to be February next year, um, and it's going to finish at South by Southwest Festival. So going to be a lot of running, going to gigs, and just, yeah, just kind of like meeting characters on the road and, and finding out why musicians run, finding out why, why other people run, and just, yeah, hopefully it'll help me work out why I run. Nice. Right nice. So, we'll get cool. so we have, we have a, another um, online meeting <laughs> next month, April. With Lady Southpaw will be our friend and moderator. Uh, it looks like we are getting the curtain drop right now. So our friend Jocelyn at Zero Shoes has announced a winner. From hey Jocelyn, are you there? Can you actually pop your face in and let us know the winner was oh. selected? Kathy Anderson. There she yeah. is. Yay! I, I recognize Kathy. I wonder if she lives in Wyoming. Can't hear you, Jocelyn. Oh, you're, you're muted. Jocelyn. Thanks, guys. No, we we hey, need to announce the newsletter too, right? Yeah. So the, the launch of the shoe that Chris spoke about is April 13th. Yeah. If so want, go, go, go to zeroshoes.com slash born to run to sign up to be notified for the newsletter. And um, if you sign up, you'll be the first to know of the official shoe launch. You can actually even shop it a day early. Um, and we have limited quantities, so make sure to sign up. You don't want to miss out on this. Right on. Hey. Jimmy, we're going to get you a pair, dude. We'll get you a pair for sure. If um, No, we're just going to get you a pair. No, I'll be just going to drone over. No, there. I'd love a pair. I would, I would love a pair, definitely. We'll hook you up, Jimmy. Yes, thank you very much. I'll, um, I'll go run in and shout in about music and those, definitely. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. So, Kathy, make sure you email Sorry, Kathy, make sure you email Jocelyn at zeroshoes.com to claim your prize. And I, I think we need a plug for Jimmy's music. Where where, where can we find your music? Uh, so, I, <laughs> no, don't listen to my music. Just okay. just enjoy my run in. I feel okay. too much pressure. I feel too much pressure when there's music involved. Um, but yeah, my, my band is called the Vega Bodegas. Uh, you can find us on Spotify and stuff. Uh, and I've got a solo project at the moment called Joyce. Um, where I'm making music in the house, which is uh, quite nice, quite a nice experience. So find that and just, yeah, find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Running Punks, and yeah, join the fun. Right on. Love it. Hey, Jimmy, tonight, everyone else who tuned in, yeah. I really appreciate it. Uh, really, really grateful for your time and attention. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank you for having me.